Welcome to The Jury Is Out, a podcast for trial attorneys who want to sharpen their skills and better serve their clients. Your co-hosts are John Simon, founder of the Simon Law Firm, and St. Louis attorney Eric Veith. Welcome to another episode of The Jury Is Out. I'm Eric Veith. I'm John Simon. John, today's episode is cognitive science. This is actually a, a subtopic of persuasion. We've been talking about persuasion repeatedly. Of course, we would. We're lawyers. We need to persuade people. You know, you had a an idea for looking at what we do as a three-legged stool. Logic, emotion, and credibility were your three main ideas for what we focus on as attorneys. I was trying to think, well, where does cognitive science fit in? I think it overlooks all three of those. I found a social neuroscience article that talks about what is persuasion. The active attempt by an individual, group, or social entity to change a person's beliefs, attitudes, or behaviors by conveying information, feelings, or reasoning. You know, Eric, I think as you're talking about persuasion, which is what we do, in order to persuade, I mean, what could be more important than how do people decide things? right? I mean, isn't that the key to persuasion? I think the more you know about how you and me and everybody else makes decisions, how and why we make decisions, sometimes without even knowing it, it can only help you. Daniel Kahneman hits on it over and over. This is from his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. We tend to go for cognitive ease. We like things that are easy to think. Those are good stories for us. Thinking hard is thinking slowly and it's thinking difficultly. We are animals that like fast and dirty solutions to anything we can solve quick and easy. The theories that I like include those of Lakoff and Johnson that talk about we understand complex ideas in terms of simple ideas. In fact, their strong claim is that without understanding things, complex things in terms of simple things, we can't understand the complex things at all. So here's an example, love. Two people in love, they would say, we see that in terms of a source domain of travelers, two people traveling together, they're in a vehicle of some sort, they're going somewhere, and occasionally they run into things in the road. That's interesting. Well, how does that flesh out in the language? They say it's all over the place. Look at the expressions we use to talk about love. Look how far we've come. It's been a long, bumpy road. We can't turn back now. These are expressions we use when we're traveling, How do metaphors fit in to how we decide things or how we understand things? Is it a method of simplifying it? If we see a complex situation and we can compare it to something that we already know that's understandable? Exactly. Okay. That's it. For Lakoff and Johnson, it's a clue to how we think. They say not only do we think in terms of these metaphors, we have to think in terms of these metaphors as far as complex ideas. So let me give you this example. If I have a complex medical malpractice case and the system that the doctors set up has all kinds of landmines in it, there's no continuity of care, there are policies and procedures, and and really what happened is the metaphor, our client fell through the cracks. That's a metaphor, you know, fell through the cracks. The other thing that I see in the case is the reason, you know, I always like to look at, okay, what happened? This child fell through the cracks. Well, why did that happen? And I look closely at that issue. Why did it happen? Did there rules and policies and procedures, motivation in, in everything? Every case that we have as lawyers, I look for the motivation. Why did this happen? Not just what happened. That's not the end of it. That's the beginning. And they're seeing a lot of patients, maybe too many patients. And the metaphor that came to mind for me was assembly line medicine, right? And I put those two together And immediately you listen to it and you're like, ah, got it. I understand. It was assembly line medicine that allowed my client to fall through the cracks. This is nothing but assembly line medicine. They really don't care. The patient's interests aren't first. Now, the other thing too is why is it assembly line medicine? That's another level, right? And the answer to that, I think, is profits over safety. I haven't said anything about the actual facts of the case or the people involved. And everybody in this room knows all about it. They know what the case is about, right? And it's just because the metaphors, you start with profits over patient safety, and then that results in assembly line medicine, which then results in a child 
falling through the cracks. So what Johnson and Lakoff would say is there's two kinds of metaphors. One is where I, I pluck the petal of a flower and I go, this petal of the flower is like a boat, you know, something that no one's ever said before. And that would be a fanciful metaphor where I'm trying to be creative. But a lot of the metaphors that structure our thought, those are what they call conceptual metaphors. They are embedded in our body routines. We have been through places where we've stepped over cracked surfaces and we don't want to stick our foot in the crack. We don't want to fall into the crack. It's a real physical sensory motor routine that's repeated over and over in everybody's lives, not just yours. Most of us have very similar experiences. And so they would say, you reach for that because it's, it's something that's vivid. It lights up everybody's idea falling in a crack. And then they expand it into this situation where a patient fell through the cracks and it makes a lot of sense. A metaphor helps us put things, understand things and conceptualize things. But you mentioned that some folks think we have to think in metaphors. Lakoff and Johnson would say that for our abstract ideas, there's no way to understand love without reaching for these metaphors. Uh, okay. uh, for, for instance, okay. this idea that love is a journey with two people in a vehicle, it is so pervasive. Our relationship is not going anywhere. We may have to go our separate ways. That's how we're talking about love or breaking up of a relationship. We're spinning our wheels. That sounds like a car, right? The marriage is out of gas. The relationship has gone off track. That's a train. The marriage is on the rocks. Now we're talking about boats. These are like tectonic plates underlying a lot of the things that we have trouble talking about unless we had these metaphors. So up and down, gosh, how does that play out? I'm feeling up today. I'm walking on air. I'm down in the dumps. I'm feeling low. It's not haphazard. It's up is good stuff, down is bad stuff. And you can go on and on. There's dozens of these things. It's like an image. I'm talking in images. So let me get back to some of the benefits here. I think there's direct benefits. Some of the things that we'll be talking about today and in future episodes are things that actually can help you in the courtroom. They'll help you understand what works to help persuade jurors and judges. Here's one, the availability heuristic we jump to the things that become available to us. If I tell you, who's your favorite presidents? You'll give me the, probably the popular ones and ones you've heard of. The other ones that are lesser known, you're less likely to pick them. Familiarity <laughs> heuristic, the familiar is favored over novel, typically. I'll give you an example of that in the courtroom setting. If you're using an expert who's like world renowned and no one on the jury has ever heard of him or her, that's different than if they have heard of them. I had a case years ago where it involved a boxer, and one of my experts was Angelo Dundee, who was Muhammad Ali's trainer. And actually, he was working on the movie Ali at the time. We were getting ready to go try the case. When I mentioned that in opening, who my expert was, there were a couple of the jurors who knew a little bit about boxing. They just lit up. They were like, wow, I think it's because there's some connection or some familiarity with who that person is. And it really adds to the credibility, I think. So let's dig into a couple of individual topics and talk about how these things might affect how you practice law. Let's revisit emotion. And John, we mentioned already Rick Friedman's book, The Way of the Trial Lawyer. It's an unusual book. I think we were both inspired by it. It's a vulnerable book. It talks about fears and the need to know who you are when you go before the jury, Rick says things like you need to embrace your own emotional complexity is something you carry wherever you go. He mentions that lawyers often believe that emotions need, need to be set aside. That's certainly something you hear from judges that we need to set aside our emotions and make the decision based upon the facts and the law. And Rick's approach is we can't do that. That's impossible. Everything is emotional. And he also mentions it takes a lot of work to get in touch with who we are. Lawyers who are willing to live up to their ideals are not afraid to look inward and acknowledge a mix of emotions and motivations. You, on a uh, recent continuing ed lecture, talked about social intuition as an of Jonathan Haidt. The emotional tail wags the rational dog. In fact, did you want to just describe the elephant? Yeah, it's a metaphor, uh, again, that Jonathan Haidt uses and he is he a social psychologist i've heard him refer to himself as various kinds of psychologists he's a psychologist psychologist his metaphor is the rational mind being the writer on an elephant and the elephant is your emotion in other words the emotional side of your brain is the elephant 
The rational side of your brain is the writer. When things are all going smoothly, the writer likes to think the elephant's following his commands, but the elephant gets angry, the elephant gets scared, gets emotional. The writer's going along for the ride. It's a great analogy or metaphor. The point that you made is an excellent point that Rick Friedman talks about in his book. You need to really get in touch with your own emotions and control and understand them. We all need to do that, whether we're trying cases or just doing anything, just in life. The second part of that is, as trial attorneys, I believe this absolutely, that you got to understand that jurors decide cases primarily on emotion. They don't decide it on the logic. They don't decide it on the elements of the case and following the law and the jury instruction. Let's put it this way. I mean, there's enough in dispute in any case that reasonable minds can come to different conclusions. It's not as if they're completely going contrary to what the law is, but you really need to understand that as a trial lawyer. You need to understand that emotions rule the day and not just in the courtroom in anywhere, in the supermarket, in the playground, the park, the baseball field, emotions rule the day. And you really need to be aware of what emotions are present in your jurors that can hurt you and how to address those or deal with those. You also need to know what types of facts create favorable emotions for you. If you have the same exact case with the same exact injuries and the defendant in the case, it's a rear end auto case, is an elderly widow heading to church who rear ends somebody at 60 miles an hour, or it's the CEO of a pharmaceutical company. The law is the same. The facts are the same. The damages are the same. The only thing that's changed is who's behind the wheel of that car. In an admitted liability case, find me a lawyer who will tell you those cases are both worth the same amount. Why is that? If the jurors followed the law logically and analyzed the damages, you could try that case 10 times and you should get the same five with the pharmaceutical executive and five with the elderly widow. But that doesn't happen. And we all know that. We know that the one case is worth many, many times more than the other case. You've got a case against a vehicle manufacturer for a defective crash worthy design. The occupant driver of that vehicle was intoxicated somewhat. And so maybe a young lawyer might think, well, I'll just explain to them that the intoxication has nothing to do with the crash worthy design. That's the logic of it. But then there's jurors sitting there burning and hating the fact that the driver is intoxicated. What goes through your mind as far as how to tap the emotional needs of the jury to understand, you know, the logic of the, of the case. I'll give you a great example right now as we're doing this podcast, two of the attorneys in our office are in trial trying a case involving a suicide. And they just started the case yesterday with Vordire. It's a case against the healthcare provider for not doing what they needed to do, which resulted in our client attempting suicide. We did a focus group on it. We found out about people's attitudes and opinions. You mentioned the word unconscious bias. There is a large segment of the population that will not entertain whatsoever that person's ability or right to bring. In other words, they're not listening to the evidence, okay? They are just of the mind that if you do something like that, you try to kill yourself, it's your own fault, it's lack of willpower, it's you not being responsible. It doesn't matter what the facts are. Before that case starts, Half of the people in that room, no way, no how, it's not going to happen. Those are things that aren't necessarily logical. It depends on a person's upbringing, their worldview, all of the brain wiring that has occurred up to that point in their life. It's what we do in our practice. You need to be aware of evidence in your case, facts in your case that are going to trigger certain emotions. And you need to give some time to thinking about what those are and how you deal with them. And I think we both come to the conclusion repeatedly that sometimes the emotions are so powerful that your only option is on Vordire to identify the people. Yeah, and Eric, we talked about this, I think, on an earlier podcast. I did have a case where there was a teenage driver. I represented the passenger in a vehicle, and the kids had been drinking, and he drove the truck off the road into a tree. It burst into flames, and my client's 14-year-old son burned to death in the vehicle. And I started that case in Vordire by saying, who here thinks that you can buy a vehicle, drink, drive it into a tree, and then sue the manufacturer? Who thinks that's appropriate? Who thinks that should happen or be allowed to happen? More than half of the people in that room said, look, I don't care what the facts are. I don't care what they did in the design. I don't care what defect there was in the vehicle. There's no set of circumstances or facts that is going to compel me to even, I won't even consider your client's case. 
And again, the law on product liabilities, you know, doesn't have anything to do with what caused the accident. It has to do with how the vehicle performed in the accident. Completely different analysis. And if everybody were logical and rational, we wouldn't need to worry about that. We could just say, oh, by the way, this is just about how the car performed in the accident. Everybody would go, gotcha, no problem. None of that stuff's going to affect me. This is a situation where it's not even an unconscious bias. This is something you could even tell them the law requires you not, not to take that into consideration. And they'll say, I can't, just can't do it. The emotional part of me will not allow me to do that. Let's assume it's a conscientious person who says, I want to follow the law and I hear what he's saying, but that voice is the rider on the elephant. And so even inside their own head, they might be thinking, I know what they're telling me to do, but I'm just on You know, to there, do there's it. a very simple rule and this isn't my rule. This is a rule that, you know, I've been told over the years by attorneys for the last three, four decades. We had Tom Strong on one of our podcasts and he sets it out in his book. The same thing that I've heard over and over again. Jurors help people that they like. Jurors help people that they like. They punish people that they don't like. And, you know, everybody needs to remember jurors don't just give money, they take it. So what does that mean? That's primarily emotions. If you have a client who's the plaintiff in a personal injury lawsuit and there are aspects of your client's background and life that make people like them, your chances of winning that case are going to go way up. And the amount that you get in that case is going to go way up. You're going to ask for more. What we do as attorneys is primarily emotional. What we do as people is primarily emotional. We make decisions based on emotions. I, I take cases based on emotions, right? I mean, there are cases that I have taken in the past that logically I shouldn't have taken them. I just shouldn't have taken those cases. You know, some of them I did okay on, some of them I didn't. But it was the meeting I had with the client sitting in the office. I met with them. There was something about them that just I connected with them. I liked them or something about the defendant's conduct. My decision to take that case and my decision to take every case is primarily emotional. I mean, that's just the way it is. Antonio Damasio wrote a book called Descartes' Error. Descartes, who divided the, the soul from the body, the book is called Descartes' Error, saying you, you can't divide the two. We are inextricably emotional. There's no way to get around it. So Damasio is a physician. He examined the brains of some classic cases, including John Gage, who was a railroad worker. He was using a pole to tamp down some explosives in the rock, and he hit the explosive with the rod and shot through his brain. He survived. A rod went through his brain, and he survived, but it wiped out part of his prefrontal cortex, the part that is critical to combining the emotion with the logic. And he was a mess. Even though he was healed up, he was alive, he went back to his family. He couldn't keep a job. He couldn't make a decision. He had lost his emotional map. We all have this map in our heads of peaks and valleys of emotion, things we want, things we don't want. And it's a very complex map and we use it all day long. This was uh, Damasio's opening pages talking about this man who no longer has the ability to use that map. And his conclusions are that rational thought devoid of emotion paralyzes us. Emotions are a necessary condition to allow rational decisions to be made, even purely logical decisions. Anyway, it's an awesome book. Back in, I think it was 1994, it's been around for a while, and he's written other books uh, on this area. But it's interesting to hear, you still hear it from the bench, a judge will go, well, we need to set our emotions aside and uh, make a decision. The world would be a way, way, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to be better or worse if we all set aside our emotions. Let's talk about another thing that science is showing us how we can maybe be better at what we do. This is from a book called Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning. It's a smallish book written by three professors at Washington University. And it was, from what I understand, required reading of all students at one point. And it's a, basically a book on how to learn. So when you go to college, they give you a book on how to learn. And the reason I find it really interesting is that a lot of us think about the way to learn is to keep rereading something, read it over and over. And they say, that's the worst way to learn. And they say that basically the things that feel easy are not good for you. The things that are hard make it stick. A lot of Professors will say, if you want to learn your case, like in our profession, we are always learning. I mean, every month there's like three new cases come in with big constellations of facts. How do you get this stuff in your head? How do you get it to stick? 
And the worst way would be to keep rereading the file. What really works is retrieval practice, making yourself try to remember what you read. Ask yourself questions like, what did I read? What does it mean? There's actually a related study about students who now use computers to take notes in their classroom, and they have very bad retrieval compared to the students who take notes, which forces you to summarize and make sense of that stuff you're hearing. Because you so can't take it down as fast. Right, you can't right take it down as fast as right. you can type it. And also, spacing out your practice, it's not like you want to just cram for a test. There's good evidence now that cramming for a test by rereading, rereading, maybe you get through the test better than not doing that, but it won't stick. It won't stick. They also say, uh, try to solve the problem before you are taught the solution. And before the professor tells you what the solution is, try to solve it yourself. I find that interesting because we are like students every day. We're presented with new big buckets of facts and we're trying to jam it in there. And also because as lawyers, we're trying to help the jury learn, right? They're getting, you're trying to drink out of a fire hydrant every time a new case comes in, you know, in front of them. And how do you get them to learn? Well, repeating does help in one way that the familiar tends to be more believable. This is one of Kahneman's heuristics. But as far as remembering the facts, just saying it over and over, you know, there may be better ways to do it, to present it as a story or a problem to be solved, or there's maybe better ways to do it. Kahneman has an idea called the illusion of explanatory depth. So if you walk into a room and you say, yeah, I really like astrophysics, the best way to know if you like it is to have someone say, tell us everything you know <laughs> about astrophysics. You're thinking, well, I can go for pages. But then after two or three pages, you're kind of out of stuff. And then it exposes you that maybe you didn't know as much about it as you thought you did. That was one of the tests for how well you really know something is try to explain it. That's something that I use a lot. Put the file material away, explain it or explain it to somebody. I bet, John, I see you doing this. I know that you are processing these cases by talking them out in front of other people at the firm. It's your way of drilling it in and getting mm -hmm. really good at the facts. Do you ever think about it like that? Are you? Are yeah, you... you know, I like the retrieval thing. The retrieval thing is something I do instinctively. What I'll do is driving home or working out or whatever, I'll think about my lineup. I'll think about the issues that I'm going to try to get out of a certain witness in the case. I'll even think about the timeline. We always rely on timelines in cases. Rather than just read it, you think, okay, what are they? And if you can get through that a couple of times, I can see that's way more helpful for me in terms of committing something to memory. What we do is we're forced to commit to memory a tremendous amount of information in a short period of time about a particular case. And when that case is done, you could ask me about it two weeks later. And other than the 10,000 foot view, everything else is gone. I think it's because I'm sort of on to the next one with the information. I read somewhere or heard somewhere where medical students have permanent gaps in their memory, in their long-term memory, like blocks of time will be completely erased from their memory. And they attribute it to the fact that they are forced to commit such a high volume of information to memory over an extended period of time. You know, all this information that they're trying to cram into their head and keep it there that the brain, I guess, needs to make room for it. It's not all going to fit in there, so to speak. I just thought that was interesting. Like they'll have a year of their life that they really don't remember much about. Wow. It's like part of your brain allocated to short-term RAM. It's just like it's it's a block and all it does is take things, hold on to it until the boards are over. Or the until perfect the computer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another metaphor. One last thing about remembering. There's a lot of good research about multimodal learning that applies to the courtroom too. So if you get up there and talk, 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 it might stick. You have a story about the day after a day of trial. 24 hour rule. 24 hour rule. You ask your attorneys, what do you think the jury remembers from that three hour block of testimony by the doctor? I call it the 24 hour rule, which means the next day, what is it that the jurors will remember about that witness? Now, if they remember the witness actually testified, you're doing okay. <laughs> you know, I have a case coming up that's going to be a three week case. It has 19 expert witnesses, probably. 30 witnesses total, tens of thousands of pages of medical records, and I'm going to fit that case on an index card. When I walk into the courtroom, what I need to know about that case is going to be on two index cards in my front shirt pocket. Could you describe what is on the index card? What type of information? I list witnesses' names. I list key exhibits. 
we might have 300 exhibits in the case, and I know there are 15 that I'm going to spend most of my time with. I also list what my frames are, what the case is about. I'll list maybe the five or six key pieces of evidence or key facts in support of my client's case. And then what are the defenses and what is our reply? What is our response to that defense? We've got 40 witnesses, 30 witnesses in a case, 10, 20,000 pages of testimony, 50,000 pages of documents, and we'll narrow it down to an issues digest that's 30 or 40 pages, and that gets down to a couple pages on a notepad and eventually an index card in my front pocket. We were talking earlier about simplicity. The brain doesn't want to work. I've heard since we started doing this that after the first five minutes, nobody's listening to you. If you're going to make your point, make it in the first five minutes or the last five minutes. We tend to remember what came first and what came last. And if things are too complicated, as you've pointed out from the cognitive science standpoint, the brain says no, it just shuts down. It's too hard to work through and think things that are really complicated. And so from day one, it's been hammered into my head, keep it simple, keep it simple, keep it simple. If you got six defendants and you only need one, let's go with one. If you got 13 claims, but only two really are, if you're not gonna win with your best two, what are the other 13 gonna do other than dilute your message or confuse the jury? I find my battles representing plaintiffs is always to keep people on track, keep it simple, keep it straightforward. And what I see on the other side with the defendant is to confuse, to muddle, to dilute, to make it like gray area and fuzzy. And there's a saying, again, probably not mine, but I've used it, confusion is the negligent defendant's best friend. And that's it. My battle in court is keeping on the straight and narrow, getting back the message. It's not 35 different points that we're trying to make, it's two points. And we're continually trying to make those points and reinforce those points and clarify some of the stuff that's brought up by the defendants. It's almost like you're battling an anarchist that got into the courtroom. Someone who wants to make the language complex, confuse the facts. That leads to paralysis by the jury. Right. It's giving them, you know, creating questions, creating issues, creating uncertainty. And that's really what it's all about. If you think about what we do, we're trying to build a house. Another metaphor. My analogy, I compare all the time, anybody that knows me, you know, building a case is similar to building a house. It's a long, expensive, tedious, time-consuming process. You need to start with a good foundation. You need to do your investigation. You need to have the right experts because if you don't start out on good, solid ground, the whole thing's going to fall in on you. And so not only are we building a house, but we have a team of very intelligent, skilled, highly educated attorneys on the other side trying to keep us from building that house, trying to get in our way, trying to keep the materials from arriving on the site, things like that. My experience is we work hard to try to work the case up and get it in the courtroom to try it. And as I see it, you know, the defendant's job, nine times out of 10, isn't to get the information to you and try the case and see what the jury decides. It's to keep you from getting in that courtroom. That's where the battle is. That is where the battle is. Once you get in that courtroom, then it's out of their hands. The process you described, 30 witnesses, 10,000 documents, boiling down to the digest, boiling down to the cards. It's reminding me of this quote. It's been attributed to many people. I wrote you a letter. If I would have had more time, I would have written you a shorter letter. You can't write the short letter immediately. You have to work it down and boil it down and then make sure you don't oversimplify. And it's tough work. One of the younger attorneys in our office was trying his first case as lead attorney. I think it was in his first year out of law school. He wanted me to listen to his opening statement and I uh, was in the office on the weekend and we went in a conference room and he gave an opening statement, the first five minutes of which were absolutely terrific and just knocked it out of the park. And then he continued on for about another 35 minutes. And I patiently listened to it. I quit taking notes after the first five minutes. He said, well, what do you think? And I said, I think you need to take the pages after the first five minutes, throw them away and just give the, you know, give the first five minutes was part of what I've done as a young lawyer, and, and I see a lot of lawyers do, in opening, you want to tell them what the case is going to be about, and then you want to give them the, the evidence and the facts and everything support. You know, they're going to actually be there and hear the case. So again, keep it simple. Nobody's going to remember 90% of what is presented the next day. Make it simple, keep it short, but make it impactful and make it stick. And there's that secret ingredient that you can't avoid. It takes work to make it simple. You can't just sit down and write the sentence that's the theme of your case. Sometimes you have to work through it. I don't know, you must have had this too, where you're writing a brief and you get down to the last paragraph and you go, that last paragraph should be the first paragraph. Writing the brief, I finally 
figured out a good, clear way to right. say this thing. Right. And then you pop it up to the top and then your whole brief shines much more. I want to mention one last thing, you know, multimodal learning. You can be up there talking, talking to the jury. There's a lot of data right now to show that if you can bring that data in in various ways, it'll stick more. We all know this. We've heard this and the science bears this out. So pictures, you know, images, videos, spreadsheets, charts that show the data because we're right. very visually oriented. When we see the graph, it makes much more sense than seeing all the numbers. So that's a lot to chew on in this episode. What we tried to do is give an overview of what cognitive science is, and then we tried to dive in in a, a few specific ways. So that's another episode of The Jury Is Out. Hope you enjoy this. This is Eric Beef. And I'm John Simon. We'll see you next time. The Jury Is Out is brought to you by the Simon Law Firm. Share your comments with John and Eric at comments at thejuryisout.law. And if you want a lively look at life and law from a female attorney's point of view, check out our Heels in the Courtroom podcast. And subscribe today, because the best lawyers never stop learning.